I'm Shivakant Gopi. I'm a researcher in Microsoft Research. Um, so I work uh, in lots of areas in, of theoretical mission, theoretical computer science. And recently I've been also looking at, you know, machine learning, uh, specifically privacy preserving machine learning, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So let's dive in. So, you know, so the premise is that, you know, we, uh, we have lots of data and data is really important. You know, they say the data is the new oil and, you know, the biggest companies are the ones sitting on the most amount of data, right? Because especially now uh, in there, uh, when AI models are getting better and better, you know, the, the difference uh, between companies ultimately might boil down to like the quality of the data that they have, right? So there are all the scaling laws for neural networks which show that, to get better and better, you need more data. It's not just compute, but you also need more data. So you need both compute and data to get even better. So, you know, data is really important. The only issue is that a lot of this data is private. So, you know, so if you think of the public data, which is what we see uh, publicly that everybody sees on the internet is the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more underneath, uh, which, is, which is private and on, that only these big companies have access to. Um, so this and and it's a lot of data because I know that I know I know this because I'm at Microsoft and I see you know huge amounts of data they're never short on data but the only issue for them for most companies is that this is private data and it's sensitive so if you train a machine learning model on this private data and you release this model to do things uh, you know other things there are major privacy risks and I'll talk about you know what these risks are uh, in a bit and and these risks are especially prevalent in large language models because you know these are generative models and and they and they have this issue that they memorize verbatim whatever sometimes some of the training data they are trained on so here is a fun example of like what can happen if, if your model memorizes uh, a training example uh, so xkcd has this comic uh, where where you know a cop is trying to find uh, some revolutionaries or like uh, plotting against the government and what, uh, you know, all the revolutionaries are, you know, communicating by email. So what he does and, 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 and you know, Gmail trains their models, their autocomplete models on personal emails. So the, the, the cop is just like long live the revolution. Our next meeting will be at, and then, you know, he just presses tab to autocomplete. And then the Gmail client or any other email client uh, is just autocompletes to we are meeting at the docks at midnight on 20, June 28th. So these are the sort of things that that we want to prevent that, you know, when you train these predictive models uh, on, you know, personal data, there is a, such a chance. And, and this is not just a comic, this actually happens in practice and people wrote uh, papers. So there is this famous, famous paper it's called the secret share paper, where they took this GPT-2 model, which is a large language model trained by OpenAI, and then they extracted a lot of, you know, private information from it. Like in this case, like, you know, you can get emails and phone numbers and whatnot of different kinds of people, uh, which is not supposed to be there. And this is just an example, but, you know, technically GPT-2 was trained on things on the internet, but if you do the same thing with email data, then you know the same thing can happen like you know your bank account numbers and credit card numbers can come up here uh, if you prompt gpt2 so so these are the sorts of issues that we see and and this paper which did this attacks also showed that there are lots of ad hoc ways to kind of stop this and all these ad hoc privacy mitigation measures were not really working and what really worked is uh, this technique called differential private training and which you know, though it's uh, not perfect, but that seems like the best uh, mitigation measure that we have uh, to stop this kind of stuff. What does this differential privacy mean? And the rest is like optional. Okay, so what is this differential privacy? So I'll spend a bit of time on the definition because I think that's the most important thing that most people should know. Uh, it's that, so if you have an algorithm, so, so uh, let's say it's a training algorithm, it's a machine learning model, which takes some data, and then outputs a model. So the, my algorithm is not the model itself, it's the training algorithm. Like for example, it can be SGD, stochastic gradient descent, or some other learning algorithm, uh, convex optimization, some uh, learning algorithm, which looks at user data and outputs a model or some other output. So, and this algorithm, I, let's say it is a randomized algorithm, which means it's not always producing something fixed. So we say that this algorithm is epsilon differentially private, if on neighboring databases, which, by which I mean that 
uh, take a database and you, you change only one user's data in this in this database. So so here I don't know maybe it is, uh, and then you imagine you, it's a thought experiment where you imagine training it on two edges and databases which only differ in a single user's uh, record. So like here you can see that a single user's email was there in the input and here the single e that user's email was not used during training. And, and then this training algorithm produces two models, one model one and model two. And now and you give an adversary access to these two models. You know, they can do inference, they can even look at the weights and they can do all sorts of things. But then they were trying to find whether this particular user's email was used or not used. So they want to distinguish between these two cases, whether, you know, if I give you one of these models at random to this adversary, they can't tell whether it was trained uh, with this user's email or not. This is a very strong privacy protection, which means that if you can't even tell if the user's email was used in the training, it means that no, pri no personal information of this user can be there inside the model's weights or in during its inference and so on. So that's, that is the definition. So more formally, how do you say that these two models are hard to distinguish? So as I said, this training algorithm is a randomized algorithm. What it means is that what it outputs is not a deterministic single model. It outputs a distribution of models. And in general, we say that, uh, that such an algorithm is epsilon differentially private if the distributions are epsilon close, by which mean, uh, I mean that if you take the ratio of probabilities uh, that it outputs any particular model, the probabilities of the ratios is bounded by some constant e to the epsilon and up lower bounded by e to the eps minus epsilon. So it's a measure of how close the probability distributions are. We're saying that on adjacent databases, uh, the algorithm outputs very similar distribution of outputs. And, and obviously the smaller the epsilon, the more private the algorithm is, which means that if epsilon is like zero, that means it's perfectly private. It's not even, you know, it doesn't matter whether this user's input is there or not. It's outputting the same distribution of models. And when the smaller the epsilon, the more private you are. And this definition has been, you know, introduced in theory in like 2006. And since then it's been increasingly adopted you know, in industry like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Apple, IBM, they, they whenever they, uh, you know, train models on private data, they also include that, uh, you know, they do it using differential privacy and they tell you, oh, it is, we, we trained it with so-and-so, like epsilon equal to one, epsilon equal to two differential privacy. Moreover, the US government also believes in this technology. So the, the latest US census, kind of like how we have census in India, though they didn't have it you know, for the past three years, but the, it's that every 10 years they do a census in US as well. This, all the census data has been released using differential privacy because they also felt that the US government felt that there is lots of privacy risks. If I just, if they just announce the census data without, without any privacy mitigation measures. Um, so, I'll, so let me tell you a little, you know, recipe for how do you make, uh, you know, a differently private algorithm, it's sort of a cookbook for DP algorithms. So it's actually pretty simple, like for, okay, there are complicated algorithms, but in most use cases, the, the algorithm is very simple. So it's a very simple recipe. So first you limit use individual user contributions to some small amount. You kind of say that nobody should try to influence my algorithm too much. So you, you try to limit it in some way. And then the really key part is you need to use uh, add noise to mask individual user contributions. Without adding noise, you can never make anything different to private. As I said, if your algorithm has to be randomized, it has to introduce some stochasticity, some noise into the process to mask the process, uh, to mask the individual user contributions. So this is, these are the two main steps and, and this, this, that's it. So you limit user contributions, add noise. So let me give you an example of how this recipe works. Uh, let's say I have a, uh, a simple problem. I have n people in a room, and they want to compute their average salary in a private way. So nobody wants to reveal their, like you know, their their, their personal salary. And and let's and let's assume that they have like a trusted party who they trust, so they can communicate the whole thing. All they want to know is that av the average salary of everyone. Okay, so what differential? And we want to do this using differential privacy. So what differential privacy does is like you just compute an average and then you add some noise. And then you also assume that, you know, each salary is bounded by some amount, let's say C. So C is the maximum salary. Nobody's earning more than like, let's say one crore per annum. And so that is your C. And, and then if somebody is earning more, you just truncate. So let's say, the, you know, there's these are anomalous people. 
So you just truncate and then you just assume that everybody is have bounded salaries between zero and one crore. And, and then you just average and you add noise, which is proportional to uh, something called lap, it's called a Laplace noise. So this is a particular noise distribution, which comes up, you know, which is specific to this uh, differential privacy. So yeah, it has a particular density. Its density is like exponential in minus uh, lambda times the absolute value of x. And on the right, you can see a picture of how this distribution looks. It looks like you know it has a peak at zero. So it's a not, so basically you're just computing the true average. You first limit the user contributions, compute the true average, and add a little bit of noise. So now this noise makes it really hard for me to distinguish whether a particular you know find a particular user's salary. Why is that? Because even if I know everybody else's salary, let's say I know the salary of everyone except X1, I still, so what I, What will I then know is X1 plus X1 over N plus C over N times some Laplace noise. I can multiply it by N. Uh, so what I, I know is X1 plus Laplace noise, right? It's like, and, and then I'm adding, uh, multiplying the Laplace noise also by C. It means that even if this user salary is zero or C, I cannot distinguish because I'm adding noise which is proportional to the maximum amount c it's like <clears throat> if you have one noisy sample and you add uh, you know let's say gaussian noise to it you you can't really know whether the signal is there or not because the signal gets damped you know it gets uh, swamped by the noise so that that is the intuition why it works and you can prove mathematically this satisfies the definition i showed you and, and that's where this particular distribution of noise comes in because I want the ratio of probabilities to be bounded absolutely by e to the epsilon. This particular uh, probability density will do that, do the trick for me. So, okay, but, but the intuition is that you're just masking an individual user's contribution by noise. And, and the good thing here is that, see that the noise scale also scales like one over N times some, some constant and amount of noise, which means that if there are many, many users, the amount of noise that I need to add to make it private also goes down to zero. So as there are more and more users, I'll get more and more accurate estimate of the true average salary, but at the same time, I'm, I'm preserving everybody's uh, privacy. Okay, so this is the general story with privacy. As you have more and more users, you can give them more and more privacy and at the same time learn a, a general statistic or general trend more and more accurately. Okay, so that, so the other good thing about differential private algorithms is that they compose very well. So if you, you first, uh, you know, I think I have a picture here, it's better. So if you, you have a database and you have a machine learning algorithm and you train a machine model and then you output it. And the first algorithm is epsilon one DP and the second one, you, you, you do it again. And then the second one is epsilon two to DP. The together, the total privacy loss you, you will face is just the sum of the epsilons. So this is a nice property of, uh, of privacy, you know, this, this differential privacy that if you keep releasing information about a database using differential private algorithms, the privacy loss that you incur just adds up. Moreover, this, you can do it even adaptively, which means that the second algorithm can even look at the output of the first algorithm and then output and then do something with it. And still, if the first and second are individually differentially private, the whole process is differentially private. Okay, and this is this is like you know one of the nicest thing about differential privacy that because you know in general this is what happens. It's not like you just train it once and it's over. You have it lots of private data. You keep doing things with it. You train one model. You train another model. You learn something. You learn more things. So you want to understand how the total privacy loss is happening as you as you do the training more and more. Okay, so now let's uh, talk about the specific context of private ML. So Akash, how much time do I have left? Uh, yeah, I think we have about uh, 15 minutes. Okay, great. That's a lot of time. Uh, so, so let's talk about private ML. So private ML, so we, what we want to do is, you know, what you expect. So each user is giving, you know, some example, like let's say, you know, they're, let, you know, let's take the example of maybe ads. So each person, you show them some ad and they click it or not, they don't click it. You can think of it as an EZ. And why is the ad you show them and things like that. So this is the private information, or it can be like Y1 is an email that they wrote and Z1 is like whether, you know, 
or Z1 is the next word. So Y1 is like the prefix and Z1 is the next word in an email that they train. And then you want to train a machine learning algorithm which predicts Z given Y, right? So this is the standard thing. But here now you're assuming that each user is, uh, is you know, this, this input that you get from each user is a private information and you want to protect this privacy of these users. And this is the general trend, like, you know, this is how you know, all these tech companies collect data. They collect small, small amounts of data for from millions and billions of users. And then they, they want to train a machine learning model, which fits all this data that they observe across all these users. So, so learn a good model. Okay. So specifically, you know, machine learning models, the most common ones are of course, deep learning models, because that is, you know, how, where the world is heading. Uh, you know, we want to train deep learning models using differential privacy as well. And that is like the biggest uh, question, open question in, in this whole different area of differential privacy. Like how do you do differentially private deep learning? So we want to add, you know, as I said, the goal is to add some noise, you know, to the weights, you know, in some controlled way so that you can, the adversary can, can you know, cannot tell uh, anything about the data that it was trained on by looking at the model. Like in particular, you can't tell whether particular users data was used or not used by looking at the model. And in general, there's a cost to privacy. Privacy doesn't come for free. So, uh, you know, if you plot the accuracy versus the privacy loss, then it's, you know, the more privacy loss you can incur, the, the more accurate it becomes. So this is called the, you know, the privacy utility trade-off. So it's like, if you want to be really private, you you have to face some loss in accuracy. But if you are okay with losing a little bit privacy, you can get more and more accuracy. And like as epsilon tends to infinity, you get the non-private accuracy. It is like when you train a non-private machine learning model on the same data, that's that's the epsilon equal to infinity. So it you know there is this trade-off, and the goal of this whole area is to you know make this go higher and higher. So. Okay, so let me show you, you know, this is the only promise uh, that uh, this is the most technical slide of the talk, which is, you know, how to actually make, so the, you know, training of different deep learning models differentially private. I, so I, yeah, at least for the slide, I'm going to assume that you know how uh, machine learning models are trained without privacy, which is this algorithm called stochastic gradient descent and some variations of it like Adam and whatnot. But, but the basic algorithm, you know, I hope that you, you know this, so which is that you have many examples and you want to minimize the loss function, which is the average of the loss over all these examples. So what you do in STD is you, uh, you sample a random batch from this set of examples, and then you calculate the average gradient. Uh, so the gradients of uh, the loss function with respect to all the samples and you average this gradient, uh, gradients and you get the average gradient across this batch. And then you take a descent step in the direction of this average gradient. Right, and then so you update the weights. You 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 do a gradient descent step. So this is the usual STD. So now we want to make it private, and and we are going to use the recipe that I showed you, which is that you first have to use uh, limit user contributions, and then you need to add noise to mask user contributions. So because each gradient is computed on a particular user sample, it means that this is private information. Like the, the gradient is telling you some private information about this user. So you need to limit the user's contribution. So what we will do is we'll clip the norm of the gradient to some constant C. So if the norm is too big, it means that, you know, we are getting too much information from this user and we don't want to use all this information. So we clip it to have norm at most C. So this is the clip gradient step. So you, in, for each gradient, you clip it to norm at most C. And then we do the Laplace mechanism, which is you, to the average gradients, you're going to add some noise. And in this case, I'm going to add a Gaussian noise. So, and then I do the gradient descent step. So it's pretty simple if you think about it. This is exactly the recipe I showed you. You just clip the user contributions and then add noise. And we're, but we are doing it to the gradients now. So this is called the DPSTD algorithm. It's a famous paper in 2016 by Abadi et al. It has like thousands and thousands of citations, uh, but it's a pretty simple algorithm and you can prove that it is differentially private. And, and there are already implementations of it. Like, you know, if you, there is a pretty standard library called Opacus, which, you know, which, were, which is built on PyTorch, which allows you to train differentially private, uh, you know, models in it using differential privacy. So, it, and it's pretty simple. It's a few lines of code, 
you just load a model and then you load an optimizer and then you just uh, give some hyperparameters like for example what is the noise that sigma that i need to add here what is the clipping norm how how small should i clip my norms and so on once you give these things it will it will output the epsilon the differentially private parameter that your algorithm is uh, satisfies and i will also up give you the final model that is trained so you can try it out and and it works pretty well in practice so and one more trick that you can do is like you know we don't need to uh, you know, find, uh, train our model. Let's say you want to train our model on private data, but then if you just start from scratch, you know, you, you initiate your model ran with random weights and then you start training, it doesn't do too well. Like you, you take a big hit in privacy, it's a big hit in accuracy because of the, because we're imposing privacy. But what happens is, in, especially now, we have this huge pre-trained models. Like if you go to hugging phase, you can download like thousands and thousands of pre-trained models which are really good and trained on large amounts of data. So you, you start with this model and you assume that it's trained on public data. And now you can use DPSGD to fine tune it on your private data, which is very small. And then now you output your new model, which is, which is like fine tuned on private data. It'll do much better than the public model because now it, it knows the patterns of private data, but then it learned it in a, in a, using in a differential private way. But still, it's much better than the public model in you know in predicting uh, the patterns in your private data. So this is the dominant regime it's being used right now. And you know here I gave you an example of like uh, you know some experiments from a paper we wrote where we showed that these large language models are, do really well in, even if you fine tune with differential privacy. So here is a benchmark. The model we trained is Robert L. Large. And the top row here in this in this uh, table shows non-private fine tuning. So you don't care about privacy; just train it the usual way on your private data. This is the accuracy you can get: 90, 96, 92, 94, 93. And if you do it with privacy, you still get pretty close. Like you know, instead of 90, you know, you now get 87. Instead of 96, you get 95, and so on. But that's a reasonable cost. You know, reasonable hit to take. Because now you, you know you can actually show that this is a private uh, way to do it. Like the final model you're getting is not going to leak any individual user's privacy. And you know the same story also works with like image data. You know the non-private benchmark here is like let's say it's 91 percent for ImageNet. If you do it with a differential privacy, you can still get pretty close, like 86, 85. Uh, and this is a paper from DeepMind. So yeah, so let me conclude. So uh, I just want to say that differential privacy is a, is a nice technology which lets you uh, uh, to train your machine learning models and private data and reduce privacy risks at the same time. And the state of the art is that you can get good privacy and nearly match the non-private training performance, so why not? And the theory is solid and it also works empirically in practice you know, well, well empirically in, in stopping all kinds of privacy attacks, which people tried empirically. So it's it's not just, just fancy math, it also works well in practice in stopping all kinds of attacks. So that I'll stop, thanks. <laughs>